again. Welcome to another episode of Gong Ho. It is what? April 10th, 2019. Uh, I think you know me by now. My name is Joseph Giannini. I'm a Vietnam vet. I've been doing this show for a long time. I have three special guests here today. I'm going to go around, let them tell you just a little bit about them, and then I'm going to bring you up to date about something that you already know about. I hope. Right. Thank you. I'm Jack Bellello. I'm the moderator of the program. Honored to be here with three warriors. And uh, I'm an author, and the book that I have displayed is Bonds of War, which is a World War II Vietnam work historical fiction. So I'm just delighted to be here to do this. Hello, I'm Ron Scott, Vietnam veteran, um, also an author and poet. Um, I'm the author of a Vietnam novel entitled Face of the Enemy, and uh, I'm glad to be here with fellow comrades. I'm Jim Smith. I'm a Vietnam veteran, and I work for Stars and Stripes in Vietnam and wrote a book on my 1971-72 tour called Heroes to the End. I have, I have everyone's book. I started reading yours and yours, and I haven't, I'll, I'll start yours soon. Um, I just want to bring you up to date. I, I don't know if you remember, you should. I did seven shows with a Vietnam vet called Frank Romeo. And uh, his thing was, uh, making people aware of PTSD. And he came on the show to inform us that he was about to walk across New York State to, ra to raise awareness of PTSD. He started the walk on March 1st, and he's walking right now. And I think he's going to end the walk on June 1st in Bayshore, and that's where he uh, grew up. He went right from Bayshore High School to Vietnam. Uh, this is a little thing. And what he's doing now is walk with Frank. He's walking and people are just joining him during the walk and he's staying at homeless shelters and he's talking to veterans. It's all online. Uh, Frank is um, everything that could have gone wrong with a Vietnam vet. But he um, is on a mission, and he wants high schools to actually t teach uh, young people about post-traumatic stress disorder, uh, to let them know uh, what, it, what it is, uh, and if they go in and when they come back, uh, that they could be helped. Uh, right now, in the service, and the vets that come out, they have the highest suicide rate ever, and it's because uh, they have been recycled over and over again. Uh, they're expendable. And one of the things that Frank wants to do is bring down the suicide rate. That, would take, that takes a lot of work. Um, we met in November <laughs> at, a, at, a, at an event called God and Country. Um, and we both, Frank and I, told the sponsor, we're not about God and Country. We'll tell you what it was like and the sponsor in the end said that it was an honor to have us speak. And we told them, the audience, what it really was like. Mm -hmm. And it was not about God and country. All right. Anyhow, you're going to start off. Yeah, thank, and thank you for that because it really has created an enormous opportunity for me to get into some of the things that I think we should be talking about with regard to the Vietnam War. You know, it's the 100th anniversary of the end of World War I now. And the war actually ended June 28th of 1919. The armistice was November of 1918, but the peace treaty ending the war and the cost, as all wars, was absolutely fantastic. It was carnage and a bloodbath. And going even back to the Civil War, the concept of PTSD at that point in time was called soldier's heart. And more than half the people in what they used to call awfully insane asylums in the post-Civil War years were Civil War veterans, more than half. And they never saw the light of day again. They were confined to an insane asylum, and that was it for the rest of their lives. In World War I, they called it shell shock. 
and thousands upon thousands were in mental institutions or suffering without any regard to, to their suffering in society at large. And then in World War II, they called it battle fatigue. And that was, again, I could tell you that there were almost a million men hospitalized for battle fatigue in World War II. About one out of four soldiers in World War II and Marines and sailors were affected with what they then called psychic battering. Psychic battering. So, finally, finally, after all that time, Joe and Ryan and, and Jim, they finally realized that the proper term was PTSD. So what I want to ask each of you is your experiences either personally or with people, you know, I know Jim, for example, you're very involved with the veterans causes and so on. So can you start by indicating your experiences either personally or with so many of your fellow comrades in arms? Well, uh, <clears throat> I figured out that I was suffering from survivor's guilt uh, in the 1980s, and that's a feeling of, you know, why did I survive and so many good men did not? And uh, I've been volunteering with United Veterans Beacon House for 13 years, and I'm the vice president of the board. And we have many clients who are uh, affected by both uh, PTSD and uh, traumatic brain injury. And uh, we do our best to uh, connect them to therapy. And uh, for PTSD, there are many uh, alternative therapies being used right now. Uh, people are riding horses, people are farming, people are uh, doing dramatic readings and writing letters and burning them in uh, fire on the stage, uh, symbolically giving up their ailments. Uh, so our view is whatever works. And uh, you know, if yoga uh, works, we wanna connect our guys to yoga. Uh, so we're open to all possibilities for treatment. Right. Post-traumatic post uh, stress disorder. Um, it's uh, the most, one of the most insidious, I call it diseases or ailments <coughs> that a, a um, veteran, combat veteran, could probably uh, endure. Uh, one reason <coughs> is the fact that those inflicted, afflicted with that uh, disorder don't know it. It's, it's, it's a, a very, what's the word for it, insidious uh, condition. <coughs> I myself, personally, uh, I have to admit that I have experienced that and uh, personally speaking, I, I can I say because um, when, let's say, when I actually say became a victim of it or knew I was a victim of it, uh, it was almost like too late. And that would, I would say that as an expression, uh, ex expressions that I couldn't control. Uh, uh, what's the word for it? Anxiety. Um, something that I can't put to bed, even today. I can't put that to bed. I never know when it's going to stri strike or what's going to trigger it. Sometimes people, uh, 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 people who are diagnosed with it will say, well, if they hear a backfire from a, a vehicle, it, it <clears throat> brings back a reaction, a knee-jerk reaction. I've been there. <clears throat> I've been there. I've been there when just by comment, a certain comment, uh, that I can say was related to the, to, uh, the war or uh, an incident in, uh, that I, not, some, I subconsciously didn't even, didn't even think about it, subconscious, that I would react in a very hostile manner. The thing is, is that I can't say that I'm cured. Mm -hmm. That's what's, uh, I think, so devastating about that disorder. Um, I can understand how it, uh, legitimately, how many uh, veterans, uh, how you say, became a victim. I have, I can think of a, a personal experience of uh, my closest, my closest buddy in the war, um, was decorated twice with Purple Hearts, and he he was in in the company that was uh, literally not uh, annihilated by an ambush. 
and he was one of the few survivors. Um, his post-traumatic stress, stress disorder was then, in terms of the initial, the initial, uh, what do you say, effect, where he, at, that, at that moment when uh, he couldn't speak, he couldn't, he was numb, literally numb. His, command, his commanding platoon, saw, uh, platoon uh, leader really wanted to send him back to uh, either headquarters or at least get him out of a combat situation, mm -hmm. that combat MOS, I would say. Um, the captain of the, uh, his outfit took a different opinion. The net result, short, long story short, he wound up being court-martialed. And it's just like a no closure here. We have a story out there. We have a person out there. I never knew what happened to him after that event, after that court martial. Mm -hmm. To this day, I don't know. And uh, it's like it goes on and on. He can't put it to bed. Okay. Joe? Well, at the moment, uh, the VA has diagnosed me uh, as far as PTSD, 70% rating. I, um, I see, um, now I'm seeing two psychiatrists, a private one and one at the VA. And I'm on meds, uh, Zoloft every yeah. day and Tamazepan every night. That, are either of you on meds? Um, I'm on meds, but uh, my, uh, <laughs> I'm, an ex I'm what you call an experiment. That's the way the VA treats me, as an experiment. I go in, I take exams, I have applied for um, Agent Orange uh, damage, which is still ongoing, by the way. Um, I have uh, several physical conditions, AFib and et cetera, that uh, I'm s literally suffering from and taking uh, medication for. So um, it gets to a point where age itself ruins the diagnosis. And the veterans VA is actually using that, I think, to uh, block a lot of claims. Well, all right, let's go back to PTSD. Um, I think it's, people know now that when Vietnam veterans came home, we realized uh, right then and there, or we realized before we came home, I didn't, that we were very unpopular. We were not, there was no welcome for us at all. And once we sensed that, we didn't speak about the war. Um, only amongst ourselves mm -hmm. we spoke. And there wasn't, there weren't many opportunities to do that because most of us mustered out way after we came home. Mm -hmm. My family could tell you that um, I never said anything about Vietnam for over 30 years over 30 years. And then finally in 2002, my wife asked me to get some help. In 2002, mm -hmm. I was like 59 years old. She said, you need some help. And, um, and she told me to get into a writing class. I did both. I went to get help and I was diagnosed with post-medical stress disorder and I got angry and I, and I stopped. And then in 2010, I went back uh, and diagnosed again and uh, been dealing with it. Um, it's your family, the people closest to you that realize something is wrong because you're in denial about it all, as long as you can, you know, can be. Um, survivor's guilt is part of post-traumatic stress disorder. A, a lot of us have that survivor's guilt. Why me? How come my buddies didn't make it? Yeah, if I could. Uh, sure, Jim, please. You know, uh, <coughs> we're finding uh, that PTSD, traumatic brain injury, uh, cuts across all races and, uh, you know, officers, enlisted men, whatever. You know, we've, we've served 472 veterans uh, since the beginning of 2018 at Beacon House. And uh, whites, 233, African Americans, 195, Hispanics, 41, Native Americans, 3. And, uh, you know, 
uh, are, we have 450 beds and they're uh, completely full at 40 locations uh, and we have a waiting list. And, um, you know, we had like 125 individuals that had substance abuse when they came to us. So, you know, a lot of the substance abuse stems from the PTSD and the traumatic brain injury. And we're also finding a new diagnosis called moral injury. Oh. And moral injury occurs when you see something or you did something that's against your own moral code and it haunts you uh, for the rest of your life, i.e. the wasting of a, of a civilian, of, of a woman or a child uh, in a war zone. Uh, and, you know, we're finding that um, uh, among our clients, we had uh, in those numbers that I gave you, 60 Vietnam vets and 55 vets from Iraq and Afghanistan. Mm -hmm. So uh, the, uh, the current wars that are ongoing are still producing uh, mental health uh, casualties. And because of those Vietnam, Iraq, Afghanistan, something like 225 veterans a day are committing suicide? No, they, 22. Uh, I'm sorry, you're right, 22 yep. a day. That's an astonishing, astonishing deal to, to contemplate. About the benefits that, uh, for example, you know, in, there were no benefits to speak of during the Civil War. In same, and in World War I, the veterans had been promised a bonus for their service. And then, then the government reneged on it. And there was a bonus march in Washington in 1932. President Hoover ordered General MacArthur to break it up. And MacArthur fired on and killed some of the very people that he had served with just 15 years before in World War I. And that was a stain on our country forevermore. So, but in World War II, the GI Bill of Rights was an enormous, an enormous springboard to the middle class. Before the, uh, the GI Bill of Rights, about 6% of our country went to, to college. After that, about 20%. And it was a marvelous, it was like a magic carpet ride to the middle class. Are, are you gentlemen satisfied with the benefits that were accrued to you for your sacrifice and service during the Vietnam War? Well, personally, I, I didn't even realize I was eligible for a veteran's tax exemption until 25 years after I had uh, bought my first home. You know, I put my uniform in the closet and didn't want to uh, know uh, or tell about my service. But a point that I wanted to make about our current clients is that many of them have received less than honorable discharges which makes them ineligible for receiving mm -hmm. VA benefits. So this complicates matters for us uh, because we try to refer our clients to therapy or job training and we can't go through the VA on a certain percentage of them because they had bad conduct discharges. Jeez. Ryan, I, I'd have to say that uh, I look at <laughs> benefits Personally, it's still a work in progress for me because uh, out of all, all these years uh, later, um, I am still currently in the process of, uh, how you say, uh, trying to get successful claims. Wow. How many thought, years? Well, um, figure out the math. Uh, I was... Uh, I was uh, 60, let's see, 67 to 69 in the so service. More than 50 so years. from 69, 50, 50 years. years, 50 years, and I'm still in the process. As a matter of fact, I just recently had an interview. Um, this is, I think, a veteran service. This is state, New York State veteran. I'm trying to think of the uh, actual title, but. Um, it's another avenue in terms of claims. It's through the state. And uh, the veteran service. Veteran service. Therapy. And um, the, uh, in, the uh, person interviewing me saying, what took you so long? 
<laughs> what took you so long to come here? Because when, uh, the, when uh, she reviewed my medical charts, because I, I, I provided that, uh, my medical history with the uh, active duty, and uh, more importantly, the medical conditions that I suffered since my discharge. And uh, that was her response. What took you so long? So like, that's why I say, buddy, I'm still in a work in progress. Because I have claims now that are actually in progress. Mm -hmm. And I'm still waiting for... And not been adjudicated. Uh, adju adjudicated. So I can't say that I, I have a certain percentage yet. Um, I was pretty, she pretty much guaranteed that I would have some, some level of success by... Uh, when she saw my medical charts. Are you receiving any disability? Nothing right now. Nothing? She's nothing. That's crazy. And uh, like I said, I, 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 could, I, I could list uh, the number of doctors like the telephone book that I, that I, I currently, uh, you know, I'm their patient. And if I may, you know, a lot of folks, uh, civilians, you know, might scoff at um, the fact that 50 years down the road, veterans are still experiencing the traumatic effects of their combat service. But, you know, I'm the adjutant of the Port Washington VFW post. And some of our guys who are Vietnam vets are still driving together to Brooklyn to a PTSD support group uh, to, this day. to this day. And uh, so... You know, people may scoff, but uh, the wounds of war cut deep. Joe, what about you and your benefits? All right. Um, when I went into the Marine Corps, I enlisted. I was already a college grad. So when I got out of the Marine Corps, and I got out because I decided I would never go back to Vietnam, I didn't think I could make, make it to another tour. So I went to law school, and I got a letter saying that... Um, uh, do you want more education? Substantial GI Bill benefits are available to you. This is the original letter. So I, I went to law school and this was my benefit. Uh, you have been awarded educational allowance as follows. $205 a month. That was it. To cover everything. Then, my wife at the time, we had a child together. You have been awarded uh, awarded a educational allowance as follows, 230. Uh, <laughs> oh my God. Oh my God. Anyhow, uh, yeah, I had to work, you know, yeah. I had to work full time and go to law school full time. And then after that, I had no connection with the VA until uh, 2010. I was of the mind I didn't want their help and I didn't need their help. And I don't think that's uncommon. Oh, no. Yes. Oh, no. Yeah. Uh, the fact is that uh, if one applies for VA benefits, there's a paper trail. That's right. And yeah. if, for instance, an individual would like to be a policeman or a fireman, they don't want uh, those agencies to know that they formally or currently are being treated for PTSD. That's why there are uh, VETS centers out there, and there is the Rosen Family Wellness Center at North Shore Hospital in Manhasset, where uh, veterans and actually police and firemen and their families can be treated uh, either free or at low cost without a paper trail. and. Uh, so many uh, sufferers of PTSD are actually seeking ways other than the VA to try to get help. You know, the, <coughs> the uh, Veterans Administration wasn't built until 1930. And the sign, the inscription is, to care for he who has borne the battle, his widow and his orphan. It's right from Abraham Lincoln's second inaugural when he said what malice toward none with charity for all. And yet it seems like that's just a name only without any real heart behind it in so many cases. 
that, that is really, really a, one, a, a sin, a, a I moral had, sin. Uh, Joe. I, I, I had a friend that was in Nam with John Murphy. He actually took over my last rifle platoon for me, and he survived. He's all screwed up. He went to the VA before I did, and he told me, if you're thinking of going and you should go, do not believe that the government is your friend. And there's two, there's two parts of the VA. There's the benefits where we want money for the injuries that we incurred in country. And then there's the care. Uh, most of my care has been fine, although I haven't uh, had any major surgery there. But most of my care there, I'm okay with. The benefit side was a, was a nightmare. It took me five years to get my benefits. My wife actually became my advocate. The Vietnam Service um, Organization, whatever they were, agency, they, they were like inept. They couldn't, I don't know what the hell they were doing. They actually like sabotaging me. All right. Well, Jeez. We only had a few more seconds Yeah, we only have a, but we'll continue this right. presently. So, yeah, we only have a few more seconds, and uh, we'll call this phase one complete, because there's so much more, I think, that has to be developed and talked about with the Vietnam veterans, and we can do that, hopefully, in the next segment, and that should be, you know, these, this half hour has run, and <laughs> Jim said, goes so quickly, you just say, wait a minute, half hour, it seems like a lot, it goes too quickly, too quickly. And anyway, thank you, and we'll get back to this. If you can hear my voice, just drop me a line.